A little over six months ago, we looked at the Cheetitech X Max 3, a large format Core XY 3D printer with some impressive specs. After the initial revisions made for the launch machine, there was a lot of good to be said about the printer, but it still had a handful of quirks. Fast forward to this past month and Chidi released another printer called the Q1 Pro. This is a more compact printer than the X Max 3, closer to their X Plus 3 model. Chidi contacted me back in January to see if I was interested in testing out the Q1 Pro, and after seeing some of the advancements over the previous generation, I agreed. Well, I've had the Q1 Pro for a little over two months, and at this point, I've used it to print out parts for a few different projects. So in today's video, we'll be diving into this printer. We'll go over the printer's specs, what setup was like, how it's performed, and I'll give you my overall thoughts based on my time with it so far. So with all that being said, and without further ado, let's get right into today's video. Thanks to Voxel PLA for sponsoring today's video. Used exclusively in a 150 machine print farm, they now offer 15 colors of PLA Plus and 5 colors of PETG Plus. Both are available at the low price of $16.99. This is an excellent choice for anyone needing reliable and affordable materials, even for more demanding applications. Filament performance is excellent even on high-speed printers. Bulk discounts are available along with free shipping in the US when you order three or more rolls. Voxel PLA also provides high-quality 3D printer upgrades such as the Bento Box 2-stage filter and the Bamboo Lab AMS Hydra along with many others. Check out the link in the description to voxelpla.com to find out more about their high quality affordable filaments and printer upgrades. Starting with the specs, the Chidi Q1 Pro is a fully enclosed Core XY 3D printer with a build volume of 245 by 245 by 240 millimeters. It's constructed of a steel frame and surrounded with this plastic paneling similar to most other printers in their lineup. This gives it an overall footprint of 477 by 467 by 489 millimeters and a weight of 17 kilograms or approximately 37 and a half pounds. For motion, all axes are using steel linear rods and bearings. Unlike the previous generation that had a single Z motor and a belt synchronizing both sides of the bed, the Q1 Pro has two Z motors on different drivers, allowing the bed to do some physical tramming before the bed mesh takes over. The bed comes installed with a magnetic flex plate system and a dual-sided powder-coated PEI spring steel surface. Moving on to the tool head, there is a lot in common with the X Max 3, but with a few tweaks here and there. Pulling up on the cover lets you pop it off to access the hardware inside. It's got a direct drive extruder with large gears reminiscent of what comes on the LGX. The hot end is all metal using a bimetal setup that looks like Chidi meshed the Bamboo Lab style heatsink with some design elements of the newer drop effect hot ends. Mine's a complete mess due to a print failure that I had early on, but overall it's been a really solid hot end and it combined with the hardened steel nozzle allows you to print with a wide range of materials. As for bed leveling, this printer comes with an inductive probe on the tool head and load cells under the bed, which is a little confusing and something that we'll touch on later. There's a small 2010 fan for cooling the heatsink and a 5015 on the front cover for your layer cooling. Wiring from the tool head is tidy thanks to the included tool head board. This also gives you an ADXL for input shaping and a single wire coming off of it that's routed inside of the cable chain to the main controller. There's also a filament runout sensor located near the top of the tool head. For additional part cooling, there's a large auxiliary fan on the right side of the printer, which has become a bit more common on high-speed printers. Similar to the previous X Max 3, there's a built-in chamber heater, but they swapped out the 24 volt version for an AC one. I use this a ton in my testing when printing ABS parts and found it to really help with mitigating any warping. Shortly after these units launched, there was some interesting discoveries around the AC heater. It seems that based on the wiring in the EU, that 220 volts was present on the fins of that heater, even when it wasn't enabled. Alan Mandic from Mandic really dedicated a video to this and showed that in the US this was not the case and 120 volts was only present when the heater was actually running. 
Another concern was that the gaps on the front cover were big enough that someone can get in there with a tool, which could be dangerous if that happened while that heater was energized. I feel like that's a bit of a stretch, but Allen also released a grill cover for it to prevent the possibility of this, and I highly recommend watching his video that I'll have linked down below in the description for further information. In the back of the printer, there's a nozzle scrubber that consists of two rolling metal standoffs and a brush mechanism. Next to it is a small tub that filament is purged into before a print. I found it to work okay, but I feel like the logic behind it could definitely be improved. I've had some strands of filament get hooked on top, which luckily hasn't made its way onto the bed surface, but I can definitely see that potentially happening. There's also an exhaust fan on the back right side of the printer. Towards the front, we have a strip of LEDs for chamber lighting and a built-in camera that lets you monitor prints from the fluid interface. Yes, just like the last generation of printers from Chidi, the Q1 Pro is running Clipper. However, if we send the M115 command to the printer, we can see that the version running on it is dirty. This simply means that it's not running mainline Clipper and instead a fork of it. This might not matter to you, but it does mean you'll only be able to update to the latest version that Chidi releases, unless someone's able to port the machine's hardware to mainline. On the outside, we have a four and a half inch vertical touchscreen for interfacing with the printer. This screen is running its own firmware and it is not Clipper screen. I don't mind the interface so much, but it does have a few quirks like needing a few seconds to load images on the file explorer page. And I also wish that you could access things like Clipper macros directly from it. There's on printer storage to transfer files through Clipper over your local network, but you can also use an included USB flash drive if preferred. One complaint I had from the XMAX 3 was the location of this port, and I'm really surprised that they decided to keep it at the top back of the printer. This is a smaller machine, so it's easier to access, but why they didn't extend it to the front by the screen is really beyond me. Another thing about the XMAX 3 I wasn't a fan of was the filament location. It was on the back of the printer and near impossible to reach or feed to without spinning the big printer around. For the Q1 Pro, they moved it off to the back side of the printer using an extension arm. This holder is flimsy and it still leaves a lot to be desired, but to me it's an improvement and I've had no issues loading or unloading filament from the front of this printer. As mentioned, the Q1 Pro is a fully enclosed printer, but it has a removable top lid and front door to get into the machine. I believe that these clear panels are made out of polycarbonate. I noticed early on that the filament guide tube going to the tool head rubbed on the top panel and mine has gotten pretty scratched from it. The front door has plenty of clearance, but it's a little awkward. There's no handle on the door and there's just a small groove in the bottom right of the front panel where you can get a finger or two to pry open the front. It might look cleaner, but I would have loved to have just a handle to help with opening and closing this door. Like we normally do, let's crack open the electronics and take a look inside. On the Chidi Q1 Pro, most of the electronics are located on the back of the machine. Removing the panels consists of nine screws on the back and six screws on the side. Inside, we'll find a Mornsun 350 watt, 24 volt PSU and our controller labeled Board X7 V1.0. Based on the layout, heatsink color, and the EMMC module, this looks just like a controller that we've seen variations of on quite a few retail printers, which is based off of the MakerBase Skipper board. There are four drivers for the AB motors and Z motors, with the extruder driver being on the tool head board. The MCU is an STM32F402, and this board also contains our Clipper host that's running off of an 8GB EMMC module. There is a board cooling fan on this printer that seems like it pretty much runs all the time, but it is much quieter than the one that was on the XMAX 3, which is really nice. On the underside is the final piece of electronics, which is a solid state relay. This is used to switch on and off the AC chamber heater. The Q1 Pro came packaged really nicely and setting this thing up was a breeze. It comes fully assembled, so you're basically just taking it out of the box, cutting a few zip ties, removing a few shipping screws that they have in the bed to prevent damage while it's in transit, and attaching the filament holder to the back of the printer. Once powered on, the screen guides you through a few steps to make sure the zip ties and screws are removed before it homes itself. The guide leaves off at having you load filament into the printer. If you continue with the included paper instructions, it then has you perform a bed mesh and run input shaping before you start your first print. 
Under the calibration menu is an option called platform calibration, but according to Chidi, you shouldn't touch this unless support has informed you to do so. So other than peeking inside, I didn't make any changes. So all I did was the initial bed mesh and run input shaping before I printed out a pre-sliced file, which happened to be an 18 minute Benchy. I've printed this out a few times now in different PLAs and other than some slight under extrusion visible on the top surface, it's really hard to be upset with the results. I also printed out the castle slide, which had some stringing, but was looking really good up until almost the very top of the slide. Funny enough, I printed this exact model on the A1 when I tested it last year, and it had the same imperfection on the slide. Considering this was untuned and I didn't open the front door or the top cover, I'll blame the stringing on me. Overhang wise, the bottom of the slide looks pretty clean and the combined 5015 and auxiliary fan do a good job of cooling the prints. When it came time to slice up my own files, things got interesting. Starting out, this printer shipped with Chidi Slicer, which is what I used on the X-Max 3. This is a fork of Prusa Slicer with a few nice additions. Being that this printer is fully enclosed with a heated chamber and a wear resistant all metal hot end, I was more interested in testing higher temp materials. So I loaded up some carbon fiber ABS, set the print chamber temperature to 55 Celsius and sent off a big part for the stealth press. Well, I have no idea what exactly happened, but the nozzle ended up digging into the bed for the entire skirt. And this was not just a light dig, it was out for blood. After this, I baby stepped it to the correct height and reached out to Chidi. I didn't get much input on what may have caused this, but after a few successful prints, I flipped over the bed to the other clean side. This is where I ran into another issue. As I was printing out parts for my Enderwire build, prints started off really nicely, and when a print finished, I would grab the hot plate, flex the parts off, and quickly start the next batch. Well, doing this, I noticed that my first layer started to seem pretty inconsistent, and for just about every single print, I was having to baby step the nozzle a little bit higher up or a little bit further down, and it seemed like there was some thermal drift going on. I experimented with a few different things, and I I think I've narrowed it down to being related to that chamber heater. I tried printing without the chamber heater and it seemed to give me much more consistent results requiring little to no adjustments. This sucked because to me, one of the standout features of this machine is the fact that it has that chamber heater inside of it. Little to no warping and stronger parts for high demand applications are definitely perks, but if you're fighting your Z offset and reliability, then what good is it really? Well, when I completed the Enderwire parts and switched over to printing out Journeymaker Positron parts in Soraya Tech's glass-filled ABS, I turned the heater back on. However, this time when the print finished, I opened the front door and gave the printer roughly 15 minutes to cool down before pulling the plate and firing off the next print. Yes, this did mean there was a delay between jobs, but I got through all of the parts for that printer without having to adjust the Z and it's been going strong ever since. It did a really good job, and even on the larger pieces, I had zero issues with warping. Now, why the thermal drift is happening to me when I'm running back-to-back -back heated chamber jobs, I couldn't exactly tell you the reasoning. This printer has three load cells under the bed and the inductive probe in the tool head, but ever since I got this, I've been having a really difficult time trying to figure out why they decided which actions should be using the load cells and which actions should be using the inductive probe. Meshes seem to be using the inductive probe, which may be the culprit for thermal drift. When homing, I feel like I've seen it do a combination of nozzle to bed moves and probe to bed moves. I am happy to see they got rid of the BL touch from the X-Max 3, but this new setup has definitely left me with additional questions. I printed out a handful of models in PLA to see how it performed with tighter tolerances on some more complex models like a collapsing Celtic Dagger by 3D Printing World, a Star Wars Pit Droid Kit card by Willy 3 d and a few others, all of which it did a great job with. I have a fairly big 5 kilogram filament shelf project I'm working on using Voxel PLA's white PETG, and I printed out a large spacer jig that turned out great. There was very little stringing and the adhesion was strong across the entire build surface. Speed wise, the firmware comes set to a cap of 20K for acceleration and a square corner velocity of eight. I stuck with defaults set in their slicer along with the profile that came out in Orca Slicer since it seems like that would be what Chidi believes is a safe balance between speed and quality. This has normal printing set to 10K acceleration and 5K for external walls. Inner walls are running at around 300 millimeters per second and outer at 200. 
Also for flow, they have PLA capped at 14 cubic millimeters per second and ABS at 17. I don't want to discredit this printer because it does print fast and I've been happy with the quality I've been able to achieve at these higher speeds, but it is worth pointing out that many manufacturers, GD included, use very high accelerations and print speeds on the marketing material when those are intended to be best case scenario travel moves and not realistic print extrusion moves. As you can see, it's been quite an adventure for me with the Chidi Q1 Pro. Things started off great, then we hit a rough patch, but we've finished up things on a fairly positive note. So what are my overall thoughts given the past two months of testing out this printer? What I was really hoping for with the Q1 Pro was an improvement over the X Max 3 I tested last year, and in lots of ways, I feel like that is what this is. Although it still has large panels, visibility is much better from the front, and the added camera is a welcome addition. The camera ended up coming out as an add-on for the X Max 3 later on, but it was not an option when I tested it. I'm also really glad that the BL Touch is gone as I was having sticking issues occasionally inside of the printer, and the new spool holder is at least reachable from the front while the other was not. That being said, there are still a handful of quirks with this machine, such as the scratching of the top panel, the weird front door that doesn't have a handle, the strange cleaning routine with that brush mechanism in the back, and the even odder bed leveling setup that's going on between the inductive probe and the three load cells. On top of that, the filament holder is flimsy, and they still have the flash drive location at the top back right of this printer. Those things aside, once I figured out the Z offset issue, this has been a very dependable machine for me. At $469, this feels like a lot of printer, and it's the only one I can think of with a chamber heater anywhere near its price point. If you told me you want a printer for PLA exclusively, this is not the direction that I'd be pointing you in. But if you're planning on printing with lots of higher temp materials, or higher temp abrasive materials, and you've got experience with 3D printing, and you've got some experience with Clipper, then the Q1 Pro does have a lot of potential. And that has been the Chidi Tech Q1 Pro. I hope that you enjoyed this video and that I was able to answer the majority of the questions that you had about this machine to hopefully help you decide a bit better whether this maybe is or is not the right printer for you. If you do have any additional questions, let me know in the comments down below and I will do my best to answer. And as always, if I don't have the answer to your question, I have no problem reaching out directly to Chidi to try to get those answers for you. On that note, don't forget to like and subscribe for more great videos. We make a video every single week, so there's always fresh content coming your way. And if you do want to support the channel further, I will have links down below in the description over to our Patreon, where there are some really awesome rewards. Huge thank you to all of our existing Patreon supporters. I appreciate each and every one of you for allowing me to come back every single week and spend more time doing what I love, which is making content for you all to enjoy. On that note, this has been Daniel from ModBot. I look forward to seeing you guys in my next video. Peace, guys.